Welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Sarah McDooling. I'm here with Booktopia's non-fiction category manager, Stefania Kaponia. And we are both delighted and a little bit starstruck, I have to admit, to be talking today with renowned news presenter, journalist, co-host of ABC's News Breakfast, and now author, Lisa Miller. Thank Lisa, you very hello. much for having me. <laughs> I'm a bit excited about this too, because it's a first time author title. I don't know that anyone's actually called me that before, so that feels good. <laughs> I'm honoured. I'm honoured to be the first to introduce you as an author. Um, for all the people listening who haven't been lucky enough to get a little sneak peek at your book, would you be able to tell them a little bit about your upcoming memoir, Daring to Fly? Daring to Fly came about because I found myself with a year in Melbourne where I was locked up pretty much and it just got me thinking about a lot of things. My mum and dad had passed away in the last few years while I was overseas and I don't know that I'd ever really process that grief either, but at one of their memorial services, um, an old family friend had said, you should write you should write about your family. And Lee Sales, who's my best buddy, she has often said, you had a childhood not a lot of people had. And that was a childhood in the country. And I was a kid with a big dream and lucky enough to end up being able to follow that dream to become a journalist. But then like everyone's lives, you have roller coasters and hiccups along the way. And, um, I had to get over a fear, a terrible fear that I had. And then when I finally achieved my dream and I was overseas, I realised there were a whole lot of other challenges that I hadn't even taken into account. So it's a book about fear. It's a book about joy because throughout all of this, I've managed to keep my resilience and find the joyful moments in life. But it's also what I would like it to be is a tribute to country Australia and a childhood that not a lot of people get a chance to experience. I'm so excited for people to read this. Um, we, were, we were chatting a little bit before the podcast about how I was suffering from that. Um, I feel like I know you really well from seeing you on TV all the time, but actually we are strangers. <laughs> um, is there anything that you hope people like me who feel like they've already got a really good idea of who you are and are really familiar with you, is there anything you particularly want them to take away from this book or think that they might learn in this book that they I don't already know? Yeah, no, I think they'll learn a lot because I went into it knowing that I couldn't hold back if I was going to do it. I think with a memoir, you've got to be honest with your readers. You owe that to people. I mean, look, there are moments in my life that I kept to myself because I think there's got to be some kind of limit. But I think people will learn pretty much that what they see on the telly, hopefully, (laughs) is what I am behind the scenes. I don't have two personalities. I try to be pretty genuine. I try to you know, be kind and think about other people. But I want them to know that when they see me reporting from the Paris attacks or from outside the White House or wherever I might have been and I look super confident and like I've got it all going on, inside is still that eight-year-old kid from Kilkeven with lots of nerves and wondering whether I was good enough and feeling like you had imposter syndrome. And everyone gets it, but the people who have that, they sort of think they're the only person who must feel that way. So I think it will surprise people that I can be, I can come across as being pretty confident, but even doing this podcast, I feel a little bit nervous doing it because every time I talk about this now, it's it makes you feel a little bit vulnerable because you're talking about yourself and you're talking about yourself in a very personal way. So I suspect that people will take away from the book what they will learn is that she's she's pretty good at putting up a, a front, a confident front, but actually she's just like everyone else. <laughs> so the, the book's called Dare to Fly and the theme throughout the book is about flying. So I don't think people would know that when you were growing up, your dad built 
an airstrip <laughs> on your yes on your was it a farm on yeah, your property? Yeah, on the property, on the on property. The property. Even before you had a plane. Yeah, isn't it? It's like that baseball movie out of America. That's you know, what build I thought. It and they will come. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, and then you go on to to talk about how you you um, became afraid of flying and you had a real fear of flying. So, talk us through that. So, how flying was, was a love of all of our family. Like, Dad had always wanted to be a pilot. Um, he wanted to fly in World War II, but his mother had begged him not to because she thought it would be too dangerous and he'd die. And he, in his 40s, he still held on to that love of thinking one day he could fly. And so one day he said to my older brother, let's, let's build an airstrip. <laughs> so they got the slasher out and they mowed one kilometre of grass. And then my older brothers and sisters had to get out and pick up all the stones and rocks so nothing would flick up onto the little, up onto the plains. They built it because they thought, we're a long way from anywhere and surely we deserve an airstrip. The community of Kilkeven, where I grew up, it was a town of like 700 people. And so when they built this airstrip, what I love, the story I love, and this was um, just before I was born, is that then Dad said, bugger it, let's build a cross runway. <laughs> so it wasn't good enough to just build one. They built a cross runway because Dad, he was a farmer. He'd left school when he was 13, but he knew all about... Um, what winds could do and you know he, he just it, it's as if he had a pilot's license but he didn't anyway so he did start learning how to fly but still there was no plane and then my awesome grandmother who had had the most incredible life who was said to her son-in-law what about if I buy a plane and she lived in Brisbane at the time and so this Piper Cherokee called India Echo Charlie which was named after grandma because she was um, Ida Emma Cooper. So it was IEC, the initials, came to live with us. And I loved that plane. We all loved that plane. We had that plane for 10 years. It gave us a kind of freedom from this small town. We could jump in it. We could fly down to Brisbane to pick up grandma. The most exciting time was when the Australian skydiving team came to practice on our airstrip because they were heading off to the world championships and they wanted somewhere secret to practice and someone down at the city airport said you know some farmers got an airstrip out out bush and so they came out for six weeks and practiced every day they'd take off they'd come down in their beautiful parachutes and Trudy, my younger sister, and I would go and sit on the grass near the hangar and just watch these magical things fly from the sky. It was so beautiful. So I felt like having the plane, and I say the plane, we used to call her she or, you know, we always called her India Echo Charlie. We just still, you know, even after we sold India Echo Charlie, we kept an eye on where she was and who owned her. So here is the terrible thing. Here's the... Here's the tragedy of my brother learned to fly. My sister wanted to be a hostie. I love flying. I was a TAA junior wings member. My dad loved flying. And then when I was a junior reporter in Townsville, I was in a midair incident that was really scary in a thunderstorm and an engine stalled on a six seater plane. And that moment, I had no idea it was going to have the most incredible ramifications on my life. For the next 10 years, I developed a fear, slowly built up until it got to the point where if you said to me, you're going to get on a 737 from Sydney to Melbourne in three days, I would start having diarrhea. I was so terrified of that concept. I was a reporter still. And I was flying places, so I had to do the job. Like I never, I never not got on a plane, but the fear was so great. I couldn't take sleeping tablets or anything like that because I always had to work at the other end. On the morning of the departure for our honeymoon, I said to my then husband, I'm sobbing at the airport and I'm saying, how could you do this to me? 
how could you organise a honeymoon that involves flying to Greece? And I was so upset. So I just wanted to give people a bit of an idea about, because a lot of people say, oh, I don't like flying or I'm afraid of flying. Yeah. I was truly <laughs> afraid of flying. But I was dreaming of being a foreign correspondent. Yes. And my dad would say, oh, Lassie, Lassie, it's so safe. And, and the whole family were distressed for me because they all loved flying. They, you know, like if our family was sitting around at lunch and there was the sound of a plane outside, we would all run out and grab the monoculars and see what kind of plane it was. Was it an underwing plane, an overwing plane? Was it an A340 heading to Hong Kong? We'd all know what was going on. <laughs> and so for me to develop this fear of flying was such a huge thing in my life. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it built up and built up until we got to one particular day where my husband just said, this cannot go on. So how did you address it? In the book, you touch on that. So tell people what you did, how, how, how you overcame it. Yeah, well, I did a fear of flying course. Yeah. But one of the best things that the course instructors said to me was, you've taken a decade to create this monster of a fear inside of you it's going to take work and it's going to take time to get rid of it and it, it took a couple of years and i worked super hard at it i had every time i got on a plane i'd have little cardboard cards in my hand which would say a jet can take off on one engine or there are um, airports between brisbane and sydney that a jet can make an emergency um, landing on. I had all of these mantras that I could reassure myself. Um, but because for the, while I had the fear, I was convinced every time I got on a plane that I would die, like I knew I was going to die. And it, this was just before 2001, mm. which was handy for me because it meant that when I did the fear of flying course, it was with ANSET, which no longer exists. But ANSET had such great respect for their fearful flyers that if you got on the plane and you, it was on your boarding pass, it said fearful flyer. And so the, the, air, the attendant would immediately look at that and go, would you like to sit in the cockpit, Miss Miller? <laughs> and they would let you do your flying because you were a fearful flyer who'd done the course, they would let you do your flying in the cockpit. And so, of course, because I was like Rain Man of every crash, every detail, I would just challenge the pilots for the whole flight. So they must have hated it when I got on board because I'd say, when was this jet last serviced? Can I please see the maintenance logs? Why does the air conditioning drip water? <laughs> I know, I'm making myself sound <laughs> just so crazy. So explain it. Were you actually sitting in the cockpit yes. with yes. the pilots? I know. Oh, my God. What a world. Can you imagine it? No. <laughs> so I know. So um, then I had this really funny time when uh, – because of there'd been these um, pilot strikes, I think in the yeah. 1980s, and we ended up with a lot of foreign pilots in Australia. And so I got on this plane once, it was an ANSET plane, and it was a French pilot, and French ANSET pilot. So I go through my, you know, I say, thank you, I'm a fearful fly, yes, yes. And I say, now just confirming, you know, a, a Boeing jet can take off on one engine, correct? I'm saying this to the pilot, right? And the pilot says, the pilot says in this really thick French accent, he says, oh, yes, it can happen, but it would not be pretty. <laughs> and, of course, I think I should not be sitting here with this pilot. If he does not know that he's supposed to be giving me comfort and not suggesting that, you know, taking off on one engine would not be pretty, oh, dear. Anyway funny times you've got to laugh about it it did it took me a while to get over it and even when i first became a foreign correspondent which was after 2001 mm -hmm. and i moved to america um for my first posting in washington i was still a bit nervous it was taking a lot of effort to work on it but i was improving all the time but i had a wonderful producer in the abc office in washington who had a list of um airlines that I felt comfortable flying on and she called it the safe for Lisa planes and so she would book all our travel and every now and then she'd make a mistake and I'd say mm -mm -mm -mm. 
that's the airline that crashed in the Florida Air Everglades, mm. and all they've done is change their name. They haven't fixed their maintenance. <laughs> and she Lovely, like, oh, you applied. Okay, <laughs> you, you applied like journalistic uh, study into all of the air, airplane <laughs> lines. <laughs> And so can I just say for the fearful flyers who might be listening, the, the, what I really want people to get out of the book is that I, I'm cured. I'm so cured that I went from being someone who couldn't get on a 737 without being sick to now thinking, when can I fly again? I cannot wait for that feeling, it, you know, and it, it was so empowering for that to happen, to, to overcome a fear and it's the most incredible feeling in my life. So I think if I had to go through that fear just to feel what was on the other side of it, then I, I would live through that fear again because recovering from it has made me just feel like I can do so much more. You, you touch on a few fears in the book, including swimming, um, which I found interesting. So someone from coming from Queensland that didn't know how to swim because you were from a country town. So um, take us through some of the fears that you've, um, that you've had in your life and how you've overcome those. Yeah, the swimming one is a funny thing. And I think it goes to people not really understanding what a childhood is like in country Australia. Um, there are no pools nearby. You don't learn how to swim as a kid unless your parents are going to drive you long distances. I mean, I was confident enough that if we went to the beach I'd splash around and in a swimming pool I'd grip onto the edge like a little monkey making my way around that's all fine but to actually swim laps so after I got over the fear of flying and in and but but it was a bit scary and then when we moved to Gympie and I was in this bigger school they had a pool everyone knew how to swim there was a swim coach there that I was afraid of. So it was just something that never really happened. I never became someone who could swim laps. After I got over the fear of flying and I was living in Washington, a friend suggested that I try to do a triathlon. And this is what I mean about what getting over a fear does for you. Because I thought, oh, okay, <laughs> let's give it a whirl. <laughs> let's give it a whirl, I said. Um, but the funniest moment when I, they got me a coach and he was this fantastic, gorgeous African-American guy, so kind, lovely voice. So we have our very first swimming session in this pool in southwest Washington. And I've met him at six o'clock in the morning on a winter's day. And I jump in the pool and he says, OK, show me what you got. And I splash up. You know, I get to the end and I get out, you know, looking pretty confident because I'm a Queenslander. I think that I, I think that I can swim, you know. And he said, oh, I guess we can work with that. And then I discovered later he'd written in his notebook, Lisa, swimming is her weakest link. <laughs> <laughs> he persevered. He taught me how to swim. He said, I think we're going to deconstruct it. And he tossed me a paddle board. <laughs> and said, how about you just kick your legs up to the end? <laughs> I was 41 years old. But anyway, then I jumped in the Potomac River um, for the triathlon and I competed it, completed it and felt really good about it. And then my friend said, oh, well, that's a sprint triathlon, so now you should do an Olympic distance triathlon. And it was hard, but I did it. Three and a half hours of just slogging around in pouring rain it was a miserable day but when people said to me why did you do an olympic distance triathlon i say because i got over a fear of flying so and i find you have it all very connected highly motivating friend of yours who keeps challenging <laughs> you to do it <laughs> he's he's run 200 marathons and wrote a book about it <laughs> wow so you also um, talk a lot about your, your father, who was a parliamentarian. So you'd go and visit him in Canberra. And what I was fascinated by was the fact that you were so enthralled by the journalists there, rather than the politicians. Instead of watching the politicians during um, question time, you're watching the journalists. So what fascinated you about them? I don't know. I don't know why it started. I know when it started and it was when I was super young and I had a tape recorder 
and I used to interview members of the family, like when I was five, we found a tape from when I was 10 interviewing my dad about World War II. <laughs> and then I'm interviewing him about the boycott of the Moscow Olympics. And then I say to him, okay, Clary, that's enough. We've got to wrap it up there. <laughs> so at the age of 10, I was wrapping up my father. I mean, I do think that's a little bizarre. What I can say is that we grew up, because we grew up in the country, the ABC was the only thing we listened to and the only thing we consumed. There was one other commercial TV station and we weren't allowed to watch it because of the ads and mum didn't think the programming was appropriate. And occasionally we'd have it on and then she'd jump in front of it if she thought there was something her daughters shouldn't see. And um, so it was the ABC and there was a real respect about the ABC that, um, you know, there'd be a tap on the plate or it'd be like everyone had to be quiet. So I guess I grew up thinking that what those people did and what they said was something to be respected. And then when I went down to Canberra with dad, we'd go down on school holidays to spend time with him when parliament was sitting to actually see them in action to see them rushing in and jostling for space in the gallery above um, the members of parliament. I just, I mean, I never, ever, and have never, ever thought, gee, I'd like to be a member of parliament. <laughs> but I have always thought, I can't wait until I'm a journalist. And dad was probably a bit really at the beginning, but then he was a fantastically supportive dad. Both my parents were. I dedicate the book to them saying that it's in memory of the best support crew a daughter could ever have because that's what they were like. I mean, you know, dad used to record on VHS every story I ever did, except by the time he hit record, it was normally like 20 seconds into the story. So we had piles of VHS tapes of half stories of Lisa Miller's <laughs> career. <laughs> but that just gives you a sense of how supportive they were. And Dad had said, look, um, you know, I, I really admired Richard Carlton, who presented mm -hmm. at that stage an ABC show called The Carlton Walsh Report. And dad organized a meeting between the two of us and Richard was just um, so enthusiastic and encouraging. I think I was probably about 16 at the time, so maybe 17. And he just said, look, if you're going to do this, if you're going to be a journalist, don't bother being mediocre because there's thousands of them out there. If you're going to do it, be good. And I wrote that message down on a piece of motel, the Tilopia Park Motor Inn in Canberra. <laughs> I know that because I've still got the piece of paper from that motel um, from 30 years ago, Richard Carlton giving me that bit of advice. That's so cool. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and you went, to, you went to university really young as well. You're only, only 16. Yeah, but only because there's no daycare or kindergarten or anything in the country. So <laughs> you could start school if you were turning five in the year that you started, then you could do it. So because my birthday was at the end of February, I rocked up to grade one and I was still only four. Um, and it was pretty confronting. I mean, I cried most of the time because I'd never been away from mum. I'd just been on, you know, at home with mum and dad. It's not like you had plane. play dates or anything <laughs> like that. And, um, and so that meant then that when I started university, I turned up at orientation week moving from Gympie to Brisbane when I was still only 16. So I don't know. I don't know how mum felt comfortable letting me do that. I mean, I did board with a family. We answered an ad in the paper, in the classifieds, and I lived there for a year. So at least there was that little bit of extra security. But um, yeah, it was pretty full on. I mean, look, the worst thing about it was that I, I never even knew how to get to the rec club at uni because I was too <laughs> sort of shy and felt out of place. And there was this super cute boy that I liked. And he said, oh, you know, I'll meet you for a drink at the rec club. And I thought, well, A, I don't have a fake ID. I don't even know where it is. And I felt so embarrassed I never showed up. So he probably thought I stood him up. His name was James, just in case he ever wants to come and say hello. You're out there, James. <laughs> <laughs> you touched on um, just earlier that you went to Washington the first time after 2000 and, 2001. 
but you literally received the news that you were travelling there days before the September 11 attacks. So as someone who was scared of flying and had just gotten over your fear, talk us through what that was like. Oh, look, I think that was probably the least of my concerns, to be honest, because at that moment when I, with so many Australians, were watching those attacks occur late in the evening, Australian time, I was just thinking of the enormity of the story. My then husband was um, working at the Courier Mail in Brisbane, so he immediately rushed back into work when we just thought initially that a small plane had gone into one of the towers. So I was sitting at home by myself watching what then unfolded. I can remember sitting on the couch, even though it was September in Queensland and it was very warm, I can remember just having a blanket around me and shaking. Um, they I told had the me same just, reaction. Yeah, they told me just three days still, earlier that yeah. I was going to be the North America correspondent. Um, but I was not going to be getting there for another three months because you have to do the hostile environment training, you have to get the visa. I mean, there's a whole lot of steps you have to go through before you lob into a country to become a correspondent. So the first thing, I guess, yeah, no, look, I didn't really think about the fear of flying aspect then. I mean, it did bother me once I got to America because flying then became such a tense, you know, security fraught exercise. But I was worried that the story was going to be over before I got to America. Like, I can remember ringing the international editor saying, can I go? Can I go now? Like, how can I go? And she was like, who are you? You know, <laughs> go away. Like, she did not have time to deal with me. And that's totally understandable. I mean, I didn't have a visa. I'd had no training to be a foreign correspondent. I would have been the worst person to plop in to that, um, to that story at that point of time. They needed seasoned foreign correspondents on a job like that and they had them and that was great and our coverage was fantastic but it was a really weird time then between that moment and actually leaving on December the 1st um, watching everything that was coming out of America knowing that my posting had fundamentally changed desperate to sort of hope that the story wasn't going to be over you know here is the irony 20 years yeah, later we're talking about getting people out of Afghanistan. Um, I mean, it's just, it, it's extraordinary that so much of my posting overseas, both in America twice and then in Europe, has dealt with the ramifications of what happened on September 11th, yeah. whether it was the terrorist att attacks from, you know, the Syrians who were, or the foreign fighters who'd gone into Syria and coming back out again, whether it was, the lives of Americans just torn apart by the hundreds of thousands of people that were heading to go and fight war and so many of them not coming back. Um, I do, I, I feel like my life as a foreign correspondent was, um, you know, bookmarked at either end by really big events with a whole lot of big events in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, so you, you do speak a lot in the book about all these major events that are so historical now. So like the terrorist attacks in London, um, Paris. You also touch on Sandy Hook, Brexit. You're at the royal wedding. Um, so how did you decide which stories to focus on in the book? That was really tough, actually, because even now some people will say to me, oh, gee, I hope you included covering Hurricane Sandy, which was the superstorm that flooded Manhattan. And, you know, yeah. we were driving straight into the middle of the storm and we had a lot of things going on. We were booked to stay in a hotel that was then destroyed. So we're then trying to find our way to a, um, a rescue centre because even though we were reporting, we were suddenly in need of shelter ourselves. And so many things that I've done, um, I have not been able to include. But I guess I chose the ones that I did because there were also significant personal things going on at the same time. For example, covering the Paris attacks. Mm -hmm. I want people to know that you can screw up and still do okay because that was the time that I've just taken over as Bureau Chief in London. This huge story has occurred and I managed to forget my passport 
and I end up not being able to cover the story for the first 24 hours because I'm a dodo. And I, I thought my career was over. I thought, how can I be the bureau chief and have done something so fundamentally basic? I ended up at the port of Dover. My colleagues had to keep going into France. I was stranded at two o'clock in the morning trying to find a way to get back to London. It, I just, and so I've included stories like that because A, they were really big and important stories for the world. And I think it will remind people of what was going on, but also because there are messages that I want people to get, which is back to this, you know, the front of looking confident and all the rest of it hides someone who has to push through to get through those fears and anxieties. And I did think on that particular night, I don't know that I can go on as bureau chief because I felt I'd let so many people down. Mm. And it was Phil Williams, who was our chief foreign correspondent, who actually said to me, you know what, in two weeks, no one is going to be talking about the fact that you forgot your passport. And he was totally right. Of course, you know, we were covering this massive story. I mean, people were not bothered by that. But I guess, you know, the other stories I wanted in 2017 to show the personal and physical toll, not just on me, but on everyone I worked with in the Bureau, because it was so relentless. It was, you know, it was almost every few days there was a terrorist attack or something terrible had happened. The phone used to go in the middle of the night and I'd just say, what's happened? What's happened? Mm -hmm. Like, it, that's what it got to. It would only have to give the smallest little beep and I would be awake and I'd be out the door. Um, when I covered the Italian earthquake, when 300 people died, my partner got up with me when the phone rang and he turned on the television, he made me a coffee and he said, oh, Sky News is saying only 12 dead. I think you'll be right. I'm going back to bed. And I rang him from Italy and said, I had to go, um, you know, and I'll see you in a week or so. Like you just, you, you never knew when you were gonna be launched into something, you didn't know what you were gonna be facing. I mean, it was, it was incredible. Like I would do it all again. I'd absolutely do it all again. But I also understood what it was like to be constantly hyper alert, constantly vigilant, that that has got to start taking a toll. And, you know, and the fact that I was, overseas when both my parents passed away is sad. I mean, I was in Ireland when I was doing a piece to camera in Dublin and my sister rang and said, I think dad's going to die in the next hour. And I said to the cameraman, come on, we're going to finish this piece to camera. Now, you know, just from this chat, how much my father mm. meant to me, both my parents, the fact that I, you know, as a foreign correspondent, we have to compartmentalize everything. You can't You've got to just keep doing the job. You've got to deal with what's in front of you. And so I needed to finish that story so I could then fall in a heap when I got the phone call, which I did get an hour later. Oh, my goodness. So um, tell us a little bit about dark training. So that's something that has changed journalism over the recent years. So explain what that is. So the Dart Centre for Journalism and Trauma, not the Dart Board, um, <laughs> not the game, not the pub game. Um, the Dart Centre for Journalism and Trauma is an international group which over the last couple of decades has worked very hard at doing two things, at helping people in the media be better at their job and treat people in a more empathetic way, that you're not causing more damage when you intrude on people's lives when they're mm. grieving which we are doing we're, we're intruding even if some people say they do want us um, it also teaches you how to look after yourself so you don't end up falling in a heap because media is scattered with you know alcoholics and broken relationships and also the worst thing is people who leave because they just can't handle it anymore they can't handle one more car crash or, you know, one more terrorist attack or whatever it might be. And so I've learnt so much from DART. And, and one of those things that I've learnt is that to recognise the signs of when things are becoming too much. And that happened to me in London when I went to the dentist. In the middle of everything, you sometimes just try to clutch onto things that are a little bit normal. 
So on my one day off in between the Manchester Arena attacks, the London Bridge attacks, the hung election campaign, the Grenfell fire, the building that burned and people were trapped, I thought, I'll go to the dentist. And so I went to the dentist and the dentist asked me if I'd been flossing and I started crying. And then I started sobbing and I couldn't stop sobbing. And I said, and then I started laughing because I knew why I was sobbing. I was not bothered about my flossing habits, even though I should be bothered by them because they're very bad. What was happening was that all of the grief and tension of the last six months had just chosen that moment, that trigger of that question to come pouring out of me. And I was laughing because I said to the dentist, I'm okay. I know what's happening here. And I guess that's, and it, it's normal. Like if I would be abnormal if the kinds of things that I'd covered had not had an impact on me. And what DART has taught me is it's normal to feel things. We're not bulletproof, but recognize it and then work out what you can do once you see those signs. So I took a month off. I took a month off. I came back to Australia, reconnected with the family and then went back and did another year of my posting. Oh, Lisa, I could listen to you talk and talk like with, I, I don't want to wrap up, but I, I, we are a little bit running out of time. So um, just, just before we, we end this podcast that I wish we didn't have to end, I just wanted to ask what's up next for you. It's a bit of a cheeky question. You're a very busy woman. Um, but having written your first book, I just wondered, you know, are there any plans for maybe another one where you can put in all those stories that didn't fit into this one? <laughs> um, no, no plans. I'm enjoying breakfast far more than I thought I would, even though I get up at three o'clock in the morning. But it's the most stable job I've had for a while. At least I know I'm going to be in my own bed every night. And that's a really nice feeling. And I think writing the book made me realise Oh, I've got a bit of spare time actually now that I've written a book and I'm no longer having to write it. So I've taken up singing lessons because oh I, my want gosh. On, I want to put on a cabaret <laughs> show when I'm 60. That is amazing. I can't sing. I so can't is sing. that another fear that you're facing? I'm not very afraid of it, but I just thought, you know well, what, why not? I'm going to put on a cabaret show when I'm 60. I'm going to do the singing version of my memoir. But first, learn how to sing. I love this, the stage show of Daring to Fly. I can't wait. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, Lisa, thank you so, so much for joining us today. It's been so wonderful uh, chatting with you and, and hearing you speak. And for everyone listening, you can grab your copy of Daring to Fly by Lisa Miller at your local bookstore or online at Booktopia. Thanks for listening and never stop reading. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces and more. Or if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia. Australia's local bookstore at booktopia.com.au